Okay, cool. I'm going to get started. Um, I think everyone can hear me and can see my screen at the moment, um, but I'm really excited today to talk in depth a bit about Incaterra um, in Peru, uh, about their offerings, about their hotels, about the good work that they're doing, and also give a little kind of a background on this uh, or, you know, in context with what's going on right now with coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, so what I want to start with, um, I know people, I want to do this in the beginning and then maybe talk about this at the end, but I just want to give a little of a breakdown on what's happening in Peru since uh, coronavirus has started, what situation they're in and when we can kind of expect things to open. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and we don't have anything firm right now. I'm just going to factually tell you what's happened. So um, Peru was one of the first countries um, to really do like a full lockdown of the country after its first case, which happened in about March 6th. Um, March 15th, they locked down all the borders. Everyone's been stay at home quarantined since then. Um, this is pretty impressive. I think here in San Francisco where I am, I think we started on March 16th. So in Peru, they locked down their borders. They had everybody stay at home starting March 15th and they didn't, they're not allowing people to travel in between provinces officially. I mean, people are, of course, I know that I've heard a lot of people have been escaping the city to get out in the countryside uh, just because they can get out in the countryside and you know grow vegetables and stuff like that. Um, but one thing you'll see is that actually Peru, if you look at the numbers, you'll see a lot of cases in Peru. But one of those reasons is because by mid-April, uh, Peru made a massive uh, ramped up effort in terms of testing. Um, they stepped it up 15-fold by mid-April um, during that time. And they've been carrying this on. They're second only to Brazil in terms of number of tests they're doing. And Brazil has seven times the population of Peru. And they're doing about the same number of tests, which Chile is doing and Chile only has half the population that Peru has. So at the moment this week, there are around 50,000 cases that have been tested and recorded in Peru. Uh, overwhelming majority of those are in Lima um, itself, you know, which is a city of 11 million people or so. Um, when you start looking out the provinces, it drops down. And I think probably the most important province when it comes to tourism for all of us is in the Cusco province where they have only 250 recorded um, cases. And again, you know, these numbers, if you think about how people live so rurally in the Cusco province, they probably can't record everything. But it's just putting in a perspective about the number of cases that exist, where the population densities are, and where the tourism, you know, um, is, is centered. Um, speaking with the businesses there and friends, there has been a stimulus checks sent out to individuals there. I mean, you have to consider that kind of the monthly um, normal salary in Peru for the general worker is around $275 and the government's been sending something like that out each month and they are uh, assisting Peruvian uh, businesses uh, with low interest loans. So there has been a lot of support for, you know, the private industry in Peru and for the individual. So, you know, in just terms of looking at a, a country's recovery, and we all know that if the country, you know, if the government's stepping in to support businesses and people during something like this, it's going to be an easier transition um, when reopening. So currently this stay at home quarantine, and it's been pretty severe in Peru. Like I think only like one person's allowed out of the house once a week um, to go do essential shopping. Police are out in force. They really, really enforce this, um, but they're planning to, for that to expire on May 10th. And then what they have is actually a really good plan of like a gradual reopening of the uh, economy. So starting on May 10th, they're going to open certain things like mining and, uh, and the, um, other industries, allowing people to go back to work. But then they want to do this month by month, kind of opening 10% more of the country as the months go on and they can record this. So the only dates that we have now that the Peruvian government has said, um, again, these might change, you know, don't hold me to this, but they have said that they're going to allow international uh, air travel in July. Um, and actually in July, like June, July, there's going to be certain, you know, restaurants are going to be open. Things are going to be allowed to run at smaller capacities, but they're expecting for tourism um, as a whole to be fully open by August. So that's what we're looking at. But again, they're going to be doing this starting May 10th. And then they're going to be uh, evaluating them on a month by month basis, whether they're able to open up that next 10, 15 percent of the of the economy. Um, so we don't know with Incaterra when the hotels are going to be exactly operating again and under what restrictions we're going to have, how we're going to be operating them exactly. I wish I could tell you that today, but I can't. But I just wanted to give you this background um, on it at the moment. So let's talk about Incaterra. Um, so Incaterra itself, uh, they have a lot of different properties or products that you're probably most familiar with. They're different hotels, Reserva Amazonica, Hacienda Urbamba, La Casona, Machu Picchu Pueblo Hotel. That's what I'm going to talk about today, but I want to talk about it first under the context of uh, these products or offerings that they provide. Um, what's behind it? Um, you know, Incaterra was one of the first, when I was a guide living in Peru for 10 years, it was really the first kind of hotel company where I started looking at hospitality and thinking, wow, man. These hotels are really cool. Um, this is Jose Kecklin, or just Joe, he likes to be called. He's the chairman and founder of Incaterra. 
He started this back in 1975. This guy's been a total visionary, uh, pioneer leader in, in sustainable uh, travel uh, and conservation, sustainable tourism. I mean, he was doing things kind of, I think, be long, long before we even have the, the phrase ecotourism or sustainable travel. He started this in 1975 with his jungle lodge down the Amazon, at, um, Reserve Amazonica. And then with his properties, like he was the first business in Peru to be carbon neutral or carbon negative back in 1987, I think, is 87 or 89. So when you think about 87 or 89, I mean, that wasn't like we're, who was thinking about this other than a guy like, like Joe, um, really interesting character as a background. Um, he was involved kind of where he got seeing Peru and promoting Peru uh, for tourism. He co-produced a couple films with uh, Werner Herzog in Peru back in the day, like a uh, Guide in the Wrath of God and Fitzcarraldo, the story of them hauling that steamship over the, the Amazon. Um, he was involved in that and that really opened up his eyes how tourism can bring positive benefits uh, to Peru. Um, he's a good friend of Mick Jagger who comes uh, every once in a while to Peru and hangs out and they travel around together. Um, and him, he's an incredible businessman. Um, he's kind of the guy that's noticed that if you're going to do you know, sustainable conservation work, you need a source of funding. And so he's decided to self-fund that through these products, through the hotels. Um, I, one of my favorite things I've ever heard him talk about is with this company, he says, you know, at the end of every year, most companies or organizations do like a stock control, look at their available stock and where it is and do stock buy buybacks and stuff like that for the health of the business. Whereas what he does is he continually every year does scientific um, evaluations of the ecosystems where the hotels operate and doing flora and fauna um, cataloging of species. And for him, he says that's his stock control. He looks at nature and how well it's thriving and also how good the local community is doing. And that's for him as his stock control is looking at the big picture holistically of how these hotels operate. So his thing is doing ecological research for profitable conservation by local populations funded by tourism. So it's not a thing of just getting grants and getting donations to do work. He has these hotels as a basis then to put back into conservation and these hotels wouldn't exist if the conservation projects didn't exist in the first place. So behind any one of these Incaterra hotels, you have what's called the Incaterra Association. And that is their kind of uh, their NGO that does scientific research, um, doing this from the beginning, doing cataloging of species, um, just incredible work. Um, to put this into perspective, so since 1978, when they started these inventories of flora and fauna around the properties, um, they've had 200 researchers sponsored by Incaterra doing this work, and Incaterra Association has discovered, has contributed 28 new species to science. So 19 orchids, down Machu Picchu, five amphibians, butterfly, bromeliad, and vines. Uh, that's an incredible feat just to find one new species for science, but this Incaterra Association has contributed 28 new species to science. They put out incredible documents, um, um, these are different books that they've published. Um, they've actually produced music albums from local musicians um, and composers that have won Latin Grammy Awards. Um, they produce all these great little educational tools like bird guides. So you'll find these when you go check into the rooms of the different hotels. Um, you know, supporting the local people, the local communities is top priority as well. It's not just about the flora and fauna, it's about the health of the local communities. And as you can see, um, the employees that they have at each of these properties and how many, when they say local employees, that means local employees that actually live like, you know, in the Machu Picchu area, um, live in Cusco, live in the Sacred Valley. Um, the external employees are people maybe from other areas of Peru. Um, the reason why it's dipped down a bit lower at, in Reserve Amazonica in the Amazon is because they have a lot of these uh, naturalist guide scientists that are coming from Lima, university educated that are coming to the rainforest. So overall an incredible uh, company. And to really um, kind of put this into perspective about the evolution of them opening a hotel, it's not just an idea of like, hey, there's a demand for a new hotel in the Sacred Valley, or there's a demand for a new hotel there. We can make a lot of money in that thing. What they do before they open a hotel, it's a massive amount of work before they open a hotel because it's all based on a conservation project that Joe has identified. So this is the next one, um, which is Incaterra Cabo Blanco. It's up on the north coast of Peru. Um, and this is in the kind of project stage of getting the, the conservation work, the NGO work done before they break ground and build a hotel. Um, so this would be awesome. This would be the first Incaterra property on the coastline. And the way he came about this, he was doing research and actually found that two of the current world records for like sport fishing in the world date back to the 50s. And they actually took place in Cabo Blanco. So the world record black marlin, which has not been beaten since 1953, was caught in Cabo Blanco, same as the big eye tuna. And digging in this further, he realized this is a huge haunt. This picture we see is actually Ernest Hemingway and Ernest Hemingway's boat called Miss Texas, which he had in Cabo Blanco. This is one of the areas 
uh, apart from Cuba, where Ernest Hemingway hung out and drank himself to death and, and fished. So looking at this, Job was like, this is incredible. Peru has so much marine diversity to offer, and it's not really known. We're known for Machu Picchu and the Amazon and the Andes. And so um, they've been working in the last few years and getting this project going in Cabo Blanco with um, redoing the water source for the local community, which was destroyed in El Nino in 1983. One of the problems, these people are mostly artisanal fishermen, but most of the fish they catch in an artisanal manner um, is only sold locally because they don't have an ice plant. They don't have a way to like, you know, freeze and refrigerate fish to then for export to say to Lima or other areas. So they set up an ice plant there and they're helping set up um, agreements from the local fishermen to sell their fish to local restaurants in Lima. Some of the best restaurants in the world that want this artisanally caught fish from Cabo Blanco. Um, he bought and restored uh, Hemingway's fishing boat in this Texas, which is there, and that's going to be incorporated into excursions eventually. Um, he has a proposal going with the Ministry of the Environment to create the first marine reserve in Peru. So Peru, again, it's known for Atacama, Amazon, Andes, Machu Picchu, but it's not really known for like the, the rich, rich coastline that it has. And there's no, there's no other marine reserve. So they want to build a marine reserve there to protect this area. Um, it's been kind of ravaged by Japanese um, longline fishing. So this is what they're doing right now. And this has been going on for, I'd say, like five, six years. They're working with the community and working you know, with a local environment there to get it healthy in order to then be able to sustain tourism coming there, you know, in a, in a sustainable manner. So that was just a little background of what's coming up next for Inca Terra. And now when I talk about all these other properties that are currently operating that you probably have had guests to, um, you'll understand the background that goes into them. So the way I wanted to do this was kind of take you on a trip through Peru, which I think is one of the best progressions or itineraries. Um, this is following um, kind of, uh, what's a good altitude profile visiting Peru, starting at the lowest and going up to the highest of where the properties are. So we're gonna start down on the Amazon, then we're gonna go straight to Machu Picchu, uh, which is the next highest thing, and then to the Sacred Valley and then to Cusco. And we're gonna look at each of the properties along the way um, with them. So um, again, I talked about altitude, something you need to take in consideration when planning any trip in Peru. Um, we have this great little guide which shows where things are. Most people think that Machu Picchu is like the highest spot in Peru, but it's not. So looking at this, it's only 6,627 feet compared to say where Cusco is at 11,152. Um, so you'll see as the itinerary goes why it makes sense to do it this way. So we're gonna go in first into the Peruvian Amazon where uh, Inca Terra started in 1975. Um, and we're, this is gonna be down in the Tambopata area or the Madre de Dios province, which is in the south of Peru. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Um, so this is the Madre de Dios province. And one thing I want to say just about tourism in Peru uh, to the Amazon is that all this area is the Amazon. This is the largest the Amazonas province where Iquitos is. Um, you kind of have two Amazon options when uh, in Peru. You've either got lodge-based, like the lodges that Incaterra operate in this Tambopata area in the province of Madre de Dios. And then you have, most people are aware of the luxury cruise ships. So those luxury cruise ships are actually up here in the Iquitos region on the main trunk of the Amazon out of Iquitos. Um, so kind of differences to understand about is that, you know, coming to the Madre de Dios area where the Inca Terra lodges are, you're coming straight from Cusco. We don't have fixed dates. You can come one, two, three, four, five, six, however many nights you want, whereas the cruise ships do have fixed dates. So if you're going to have them on a cruise ship, you're going to look at the cruise date. You're going to plan the itinerary around those departure dates, whereas this you can put, you know, the Inca Terra lodge in the beginning of the itinerary, at the end of the itinerary, any date you want. It's, it, we're not. We don't have fixed schedules. Um, much easier flights on like a 45 minute flight from Cusco down there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just a kind of a bit of a difference. Both of them, either you're doing a cruise in the, uh, up in like on the Aqua, the Aria, the Delphine, something like that. They're incredible experiences. Um, super uber luxury. Um, it's a different experience than coming to these lodges, which are, you know, deep in the jungle off the grid. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there first of all. So to give you a map of where Inca Terra has the two principal lodges in this area, um, you fly into Puerto Maldonado. Um, commercial flights, these aren't puddle jumpers, these are commercial flights that come into Puerto Maldonado. And then you have Hacienda Concepcion downstream on the Madre de Dios River, and you also have the Reserva Amazonica there. So both of the lodges are accessed from Puerto Maldonado. So you're flying into Puerto Maldonado, and that has daily direct flights from Lima, which is about an hour and a half, or from Cusco, it takes about 40 minutes. So it's pretty spectacular. You can be in Cusco, high in the Andes, Incan capital in the morning having breakfast, and by lunchtime you're down in the Amazon. Um, so once you've flown into Puerto Maldonado Airport, the Inca Terra staff pick guests up and then they transport them in vehicles to the river port, which sits at the confluence of the Tambopata and Madre de Dios rivers. Um, here they're going to board motorized dugout canoes for transport downstream um, to one of the lodges. So depending upon which lodge they're going to, 
if they're going down to Hacienda Concepcion, it's about a 15 to 30 minute trip. And I say that because obviously the river levels fluctuate throughout the year. Um, it's longer coming up the river when, um, when you're leaving. Um, so that's kind of the variance. And then if you're going down to uh, Reserva Amazonica, it's about 30 to 45 minutes, depending upon water flow and which direction you're traveling in. So that's how you get to either of these two lodges. Um, so again, you can kind of start in Cusco in the morning. You can be here for lunch at these lodges, like a late lunch uh, there. So I'm going to start with Incaterra Reserve Amazonica. This was the first property. This is the one that Joe started in 1975 when he started to develop this idea of conservation through tourism. Um, and I want to start by just talking about kind of what characterizes this particular jungle lodge compared to Incaterra's other one, which is Hacienda Concepcion. Because people that haven't been there, they often will contact their DMC or contact Incaterra. And they'll say, oh, I want them to stay at Reserve Amazonica. And then they'll say, well, there's no room there, but there is room in Hacienda Concepcion or vice versa. And people don't really understand it. Um, but Incaterra Reserve Amazonica, uh, it's got a riverside location. Um, it's got these kind of open grounds. You can see the different guest cabanas there. Cabanas there. Um, definitely a much more grand design. It's like I say, like the more impressive architecturally of the lodges. It's got more bells and whistles. It's more, I think, um, visually appealing um, in a way. Um, you're on that riverfront. It just feels open air. Um, they've got multiple room categories at Reserve Amazonica to choose from, which I'm going to go into. And then also all the excursions that are included uh, in the rates here, the guests can choose. They can choose a la carte excursions. We have, you know, a dozen different excursions and guests can say these are the ones that I want to do. So that kind of what typifies Reserve Amazonica. So I'm going to take you a little property walkthrough. This is the main lodge. So this is the common area. This is where all the meals are served, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, we don't really do... Uh, we do kind of snacks out on the excursions, but most of it you're going, you're getting up very early in the morning, sometimes doing an excursion before breakfast, coming back and having breakfast, having some time to chill. So you're going out and doing multiple excursions during the day, but then this is the main common area coming back where, you know, the meals are served. Um, wonderful sitting areas all over this. So there's plenty of room for people to spread out. Um, there's an upper level and a lower level with all these different seating areas. So people are not squashed together here. You can see it's screened in. This is not an enclosed structure, so it's open air, um, which is wonderful. Um, these are the individual guest cabanas. So there's 35 in total and there's four different categories. And like I said, this is different from Hacienda Concepcion that you have all of these room categories at Reserve Amazonica. So starting out, you've got the Superior Cabanas and then you have the Superior Rio. The only difference between these is that the Superior Rio are the ones that front the riverfront here. So um, they're kind of the exact same layout. It's just that that row that fronts along the river. Some people want the riverfront view. Um, other people don't really care about that. So here's the interior of one of those. Um, so they're all ensuite bathroom, um, solar powered ceiling fans, solar powered hot water, um, but they are open air. Um, there is no air conditioning. You know, this is a generator run property and solar run. You don't really have a, um, the wattage available to do air conditioning, nor would you really want or need to um, in this area. Um, so we also have one suite, the Amazonica suite, which is much larger um, room overall. And then we have two of the Tambo Pata suites. And the big thing with these Tambo Pata suites is that they have the private plunge pools um, back and behind the bathroom. So that's a nice thing during a, after a hot, sweaty excursion coming back and dipping in your cold plunge pool there. So all the excursions are included uh, at the lodge. Um, this is just a short list of the various excursions. And again, so guests coming here, depending upon how many nights you're staying, they can kind of decide. They talk with the guides when they arrive and decide which ones they really want to do um, while there. And so these excursions are taking place on the trail network that's surrounding the lodge. Um, there's going through wetlands, going through primary forest, um, going through secondary forest, learning the difference of those. We do a lot of excursions by boat, so whether that's motorized dugout canoe up and down the river. We also do them at nighttime to spot nocturnal creatures like caiman and um, tapir and capybara, which you often see at night. Um, we also hikes into some of these remote oxbow lakes like Lake Sandoval, um, looking at excursion. I mean, let's see. Um, so I'm going to answer some questions at the end. I just saw someone asked about children. So they can do extra beds in there as well um, in those cabanas. Um, and then the other thing that, how do I get back to this? So again, wildlife there, um, incredible ray. You're probably going to see about three or four different species of primates there from squirrel monkeys, capuchin monkeys. Um, you might see some spider monkeys. Uh, there are giant river otter that are in uh, the oxbow lakes. Um, a lot of different, you know, uh, amphibians, tons of bird species, um, and nighttime seeing came in. So you do see a lot of wildlife. The one thing that you don't see down here, though, that you would see, say, like if you went on a river cruise up um, out of Iquitos on the main trunk of the Amazon is pink river dolphins. Pink river dolphins don't come up in this area. So that's kind of like the one major species 
that if you're dead set on seeing, you don't want to go to this area, you want to go on a cruise up in the, you know, out of the Quitos to see that. So, but great biodiversity of, of wildlife. Um, Inca Terra also has an incredible canopy walkway, which is at Reserve Amazonica. It's just a couple minutes downstream of where the lodge is. Um, so this has two towers that you go up, eight platforms, seven bridges in between. It's incredible. It's a full half day excursion to be able to see all the, the wildlife that's up and the canopy level uh, of the forest. And they've even built this tree house, which is super cool. There's only one, one of these. This is an additional charge. I don't know, I think it's like $400 a night or so, but you can have guests. Maybe they're doing three nights there. They can actually book this and spend, you know, a hundred, uh, spend a night a hundred feet up in, in the forest canopy. And they have a butler, which, you know, you want to make sure that you ask for the right things because that poor guy has to go up like thousands of stairs all the time and you sleep here um, in the treehouse overnight. So a really, really cool experience. I've done it before and just like waking up and sitting out on the balcony and watching sunrise from up there is phenomenal. They also have a spa at Reserve Amazonica. So again, this lodge is like way more upscale and kind of details compared to Hacienda Concepcion. Um, so talking about Hacienda Concepcion, the other lodge that they had there, this was originally was built in conjunction with National Geographic and this was a researcher's um, station. Um, and then once that project was done, then they turned it into a, um, into a lodge. So the difference was this compared to Reserve Amazonica is Hacienda Concepcion. It's just upstream. Uh, it's on the other bank, but it's set back in the forest. It's like back in the jungle. It's not on the riverfront. It sits on next to this oxbow lake, beautiful oxbow lake that attracts a ton of wildlife. Um, it's kind of a more utilitarian design since it was built as a research station initially before it was turned into a, a guest lodge. And they only have two different room categories, um, which are, are you know very distinct. Um, and also the programs here, like if you're doing a two night program, three night program, four night program, they actually have six programs. We don't do the a la carte options there. Um, so you do reach this by river, this is the entrance, but then you walk back from the river's front, maybe three, four minutes back into the rainforest where the main lodge uh, is located. So, you know, people often ask me which one I like better. I'm like, well, I think I reserve Amazonica is more beautiful. I love laying in a hammock looking at the river flowing by. But when it comes to the like sounds of the jungle and wildlife and stuff, this is it because you're back in the forest. When you're at reserve Amazonica, you do see riverboat traffic going up and down. You'll hear some, you know, diesel engines and peke peke boats that are going up and down whereas this you're like completely engulfed in the rainforest um i feel like there's more of a concentration of wildlife right around the lodge itself compared to reserve amazonica which isn't a big deal because you're going out on excursions anyways but you know just a different setting um so this is the main lodge i'll take you inside just to have a look um the at the area for the dining area and the kind of sitting areas upstairs again beautifully done wonderful food that they do there um and then talking about lodging so they have 26 cabanas here for guests um, they start beginning confronting that, that lake or the, the cocha, it's called, um, the Oxbow Lake. And so you have the cabanas, 26 of these, and all of these are the same. There's no superior suite, tambopata suite. This is the cabanas here. They're beautifully done. They're wonderful. They're all the same layout. These, some of these are more desirable. I really like the ones that front the Oxbow Lake. Um, you could try to request that at the time of booking um, to have one of those that are in front of that. Um, and then apart from that, we also have in the main lodge, there's four rooms. And so these were ones that we kept over from the days of the research scientists coming. But with these serve as, we wanna make it accessible for people at different price points. So, um, you know, this, the cabanas at Concepcion are a lower price point than the, than the cabanas at Reserve Amazonica. Um, so this is a different price point place. And then the rooms in the main lodge are a lower, um, you know, price point as well, but much more simple. So this is upstairs in the main lodge where we have four rooms. They're just more simple, you know, and people just, they don't really care where they're sleeping. This is a room. It's a lower cost. They want to have the experience there in the rainforest. There it is. So like I said, the excursions that are included here um, are more fixed. You kind of, where there's a two, three, four night stay thing. What's cool about this property though, because most of the guests, like if you're staying at Reserva Amazonica or you're staying at Concepcion, most of the trail walks you do will do, be on the immediate trail networks of the lodges. And at Hacienda Concepcion, um, this at one time was a Brazil nut plantation and it was also a cacao, cacao plantation. So they still have areas where they left some of the Brazil nut trees and the cacao. And so there's a whole like Brazil nut thing, which is fascinating. There's a whole cacao experience, which you don't have at Reserve Amazonica, which are incorporated into the experience here. Um, even though the canopy walkway is at Reserve Amazonica, guests of Hacienda Concepcion go do this during their programs. They'll go down and do the canopy walkway. So, you know, 
staying at Eater Lodge, you're still going to have access to do the canopy walkway on your excursions. And then, of course, at any of these lodges, we can do additional things, you know, like sundowners um, for, you know, a family or a couple romantically um, on the river in the evening, um, do shaman experiences, you know, really cool outdoor barbecues if you have groups coming, the like. And then the background of this is obviously you've got tourism coming there which is supporting all of these projects in the Amazon. So they run a bio orchard there, they have a medicinal plant garden, they're studying palm trees, they're monitoring birds, they're doing fauna monitoring, they talked about initially there. Um, and down at one of their other facilities, which is the guide uh, field station, they have an entire green lab there where they're doing like DNA sequencing. So again, I just wanted to drill in that you see the tourism product and experience, but all of that is like there to support this deep research and conservation work that's going on, really helping out kind of the world and its knowledge of the Amazonian rainforest. Um, they also are engaged with the local community. So the local schools, they do, they bring kids in and, you know, train them up about why appreciate where they live. You know, they live their whole life here in the Amazon and for them to actually come and see people coming from the UK, from South Africa, Australia, appreciating where they live and teaching them about it and why they want to protect the rainforest. This is an integral part of their conservation work there as a public outreach and education. So the local people understand, you know, what they have in their hand and what the value um, of it is. So that was Amazon uh, overview. I'm gonna do um, a spin now up through the Andes to the property there. Let me just check um, what questions have come in here. Um, yeah, I am going fast. It's recorded, I'm gonna send you afterwards, but I don't wanna take up tons of your time. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna send you more stuff afterwards. Um, I would say that the lodge options, they're much more active, like going on the cruise ships is a bit more, you're sitting down, you're going on more skiff rides on the water. Um, but the lodge experience is definitely appealing to much more active guests. You're doing walks, you're doing canoe rides, you're paddling, um, you're going up and down the canopy walkway, so it's a more active thing. But anyways, let's move on to the Andes. Um, so going up in the Andes, uh, Inca Terra has three main properties here. So we have Cusco, which is the airport area and the kind of hub. This is the ancient capital of the Incan Empire. We've got Hacienda Urubamba in the Sacred Valley, and we have the Inca Terra Machu Picchu Pueblo Hotel at Machu Picchu. So the way I'm doing this itinerary was thinking that you, you flew to the Amazon, you maybe spent two or three nights at one of those lodges, and then you were flying when you departed. You went up to the airport in Puerto Maldonado, you flew the, 30, uh, the 45 minutes up to Cusco, you were picked up, and then you're brought down um, to Oriente Tambo, it's as far as the road goes, and then you take the train, and you're getting down to Machu Picchu, like in the late evening, I'd say around 6 p.m. So that's a travel day, but really fascinating going from the Amazon to Machu Picchu. And you're doing that because altitude-wise, you're coming from 600 feet, and then you're bumping up to 6,627 feet. So you can make it from the Amazon to Machu Picchu in a day, and you're going from like humid, low-lying, uh, tropical Amazon, to Cloud Forest, where the where Machu Picchu is. So the Machu Picchu Pueblo Hotel, this is by far our most famous property. This is one everyone knows about because, you know, it's Machu Picchu. Everyone goes to Machu Picchu. Not everyone goes to the Amazon or other areas. Um, and this is the one that's won just so many awards. This is the place that I fell in love with kind of hotels and what their potential was um, and just providing a very different experience. So um, getting to Machu Picchu, you fly up to Cusco. Um, regularly there's you know up to 20 flights a day and then you can train down to Machu Picchu or you can drive down to Oriente Tambo anyways it's a whole nother thing how to get down to Machu Picchu but essentially when you arrive you're gonna arrive at the train station and then this is the private bridge from the train station onto Inca Terra's property so you have the village of Aguas Calientes and then there's a little river called the Al Camayo which separates Inca Terra's 12 acres compared to the rest of the town of Aguas Calientes so we're down at the base we're not right at Machu Picchu we're down at the base so you do take a shuttle bus up to get to the ruins um, of about 30 minutes up, 30 minutes down to get to where the prop to where the ruins are. Um, so this property, as you can see, kind of back here, you see a little bit of the, the what is the village of Aguas Calientes and where like 98% of the hotels for guests are. And then that little river that flows through here, this is Inca Terra's property going up the river gorge and along the railroad tracks. And it's not like one building. What's cool about this is it's built like a little Andean village. So when you come in, it's all these beautiful pathways that lead to the lobby, that lead to the lounge, lead to the dining room. And then the rooms are like two rooms, three rooms, four rooms, and their own little whitewashed buildings. Uh, like duplexes or so, they're hidden. So it's like these trails that weave through the cloud forest to get to your room. So it's not, uh, you know, a place where the maid is going along a straight um, hallway with a pushing a cart to clean rooms. This is like open air and everything's spread apart. You're in this like oasis, this, this beautiful sanctuary in the cloud forest. So this is kind of one of the main chill out lobby areas, gorgeously done. 
Um, I'm my background here. I'm sitting in one of the uh, the rooms, the lobby off the lobby there, kind of the study. Um, we've got the dining room. So here the rates include meals. They're uh, half board, so they include breakfast and dinner. Because during the day most people are up at Machu Picchu, but the rates include your your breakfast and your dinners. Um, this is the main dining room, and then we also have Cafe Incaterra. So there's two different um, restaurants that guests can choose from where they want to eat when staying there. Um, here at this property um, actually has 83 rooms. You would never figure that walking around because you can't see them all. They're all spread throughout the forest. Again, as I said, in little buildings. Um, but amongst these 83 rooms, they're spread between superior rooms, which are the most basic, superior deluxe, which have seating areas and fireplaces, junior suites, which are larger, two different sitting areas, fireplaces. And then we've got the junior suite deluxe. And then going up to suites, and then going up to Suite Incatera, which these are up to two uh, interconnected suites, which are butler served. They have outdoor plunge pools and you know uh, day beds outside. Um, so if people really want privacy and exclusivity, you can do these Suite Incateras, which is the combination of two individual suites. It's like your own private villa there. It's like the the best room there. Um, so sorry for going so fast through that. I mean, I think you can get some idea of uh, the rooms. This is something you can look later at a fact sheet to look at square footage, I just want to talk more about the experience and what makes these properties so fantastic. Um, so this is, I mean, people, often people arrive at this hotel and they walk around, they go, wow, what a beautiful hotel. I've never seen a setting like this in this beautiful cloud forest. Um, the thing that really makes this property amazing and the real value add here is here is on full display, like the scientific uh, work that they're doing. Um, Sorry, one second. Um, someone asked if you're gonna hike up to Machu Picchu from here. Oh, it would take, it takes you probably about three hours straight up. I, I've done it before when I was a backpacker and I didn't have money for the shuttle bus, but um, <laughs> you can do that. I mean, if you wanna get up there, but you can be up at Machu Picchu by, uh, I think the first shuttle bus goes at 5.30, 5.45, sunrise is around six. So you can be up to Machu Picchu um, in time for the sunrise. But you know, like I guided there for 10 years it's this whole world thing. Oh, sunrise at Machu Picchu, sunrise at Machu Picchu. People that know Machu Picchu, the best light, the nicest time to be there is in sunset. That's when no one's around. Everyone rushes there for sunrise and you're in the cloud forest. It's often like fogged in in the morning. And, you know, the peaks surrounding Machu Picchu are another 10,000 feet higher. So it's not like, you know, the light kind of gradually fills in before direct sunlight hits it. But, you know, if you want to be up there at 6 a.m., you can do that. You take the shuttle bus up and then you can be in. Um, but for me personally, the best time I think to be in Machu Picchu is from like 2 p.m. until 5 p.m. Most of the people rush, go there for sunrise, you know, it gets super busy by like 11 a.m. People freak out. They eventually want to leave by noon. They go out to have lunch and then they're like, I'm done. And but then those evening hours, no one's around. That's the time to be there. So that's why spending like two nights at this property is key. Anyways, back to I'll do some more question and answers at the end. But um, let me talk about. Um, this aspect of the eco center so again as i said this is where they really have on full display all of the research and um, scientific and conservation work that they're doing at machu picchu um, for guests so when you come down from machu picchu you come back to the hotel and this eco center they'll have a board outside saying at 2 p.m we have an orchid walk at 4 at 5 p.m we have bird watching if you want to visit the tea plantation talk to julio and he'll take you there if you want to visit the bear rescue center there's all these different excursions on the property ground so they have about seven kilometers of trail that go through the property ground so you go out on these like docent led naturalist things. And you're going out with, um, you know, researchers that are there. We have like a full-time botanist. We have a couple full-time ornithologists, but there's always visiting researchers that also, they're doing research, but in return for also taking guests out to show them the stuff. So you'll go out on these short 30 minutes to one hour walks around the property. And you're gonna discover like, just what a beauty the cloud forest is. So they have this tea plantation. This used to be a tea plantation before Inca Terra turned it into a hotel. So they kept a portion of that in order to supply their restaurant. All the black tea at all the hotels was grown at the Machu Picchu property. So you can actually help them harvest and make tea bags. Um, there's beautiful waterfalls on the property, incredible amount of birding. And they put it into perspective. So the most amazing thing there is their orchid garden. So this is something that Inca Terra has been involved with is cataloging the orchid species of the Peruvian cloud forest. There's 372 species of native orchids in their garden. So they go out and over the years they found these and they bring them back and then put them in one area of the garden. So they have the world's largest orchid garden of native natural species, open air in the world there. It's unbelievable. Um, 19 of those species that exist in there are ones that the Inca Terra Associ Association um, has contributed new to science. So, you know, guests going through this, they're totally mind blown. Like they're a wonderful hotel, but then they're exposed to this and like, oh my God, you know, learning about orchids and seeing the variety there. 
Um, they've also been working since 2001, the Andean bear. Um, this is the Andean spectacle bear. It's the only uh, bear species native to South America. Um, they live particularly in this montane, like cloud forest uh, area. Um, obviously, they're an endangered species because of habitat, you know, losing a lot of their habitat. They're very shy. Um, they mostly eat plants like bromeliads. So the only thing they eat meat is like carrion. So they actually don't hunt. They're not dangerous. This is what Paddington Bear was modeled after. If you remember Paddington Bear came from deepest, darkest Peru. He was a Andean spectacle bear. So bears that are found, like go uh, roaming out of their habitat or they found as pets or whatever, they're brought actually um, to the property there. And back in the back, they have acres in an enclosure where wildlife biologists are working to um, rehabilitate them for release back in the wild, doing a captive breeding program. Um, and some of them aren't ever gonna be able to live in uh, nature again. Um, they're there, it's a sanctuary for these bears to live in um, on the property. So this we do in very small numbers of guests with you know, pre-request uh, to visit that. This is something like everybody can just go walk to. We, we wanna keep this you know, a very chill area for the bears. So you've got that in the birding. I mean, look, I'm not a birder, I'm more into like cultures and history, but the birding, I mean, you go, with these guides at sunrise or sunset around the property and you're going to tick off like 45 birds like the only time i've ever been excited about birding is when i've done the birding there at machu picchu so all of these the orchid walk the tea plantation meditative walks all these things are offered daily for the hotel guests um and what's so cool about this is that you know people come to machu picchu to see it bucket list thing but the thing about machu picchu why it's so famous is that's an enigma no one knows why the Incas built Machu Picchu. I mean, up on this precipice of a night fridge, down in the cloud forest, the, the Incas never really went down into the Amazon or cloud forest. That wasn't their domain. The High Andes was. So why they built it there, it's the only massive like Incan um, site that's built in the tropical cloud forest. And to build on that ridge, it's like, why did they do this? Like, what was the thing? And, you know, guests often say to us after coming and staying at the hotel and going and seeing these orchid gardens and the orchids are learning about the Quechua names and the, mytho the mythology behind that name of that orchid, which tells the tale of Incan princess and blah, blah, blah. And about these birds, seeing the variety of birds and plants, people even, they go, you know what, through these excursions on the property, I have a way deeper appreciation and understanding of why the Incas built Machu Picchu where they did. Like, it makes sense. They're an earth worshiping people. And after being educated about the variety of flora and fauna that exist here, in the cloud forest, I would, if I had the manpower and the money, I would have built myself, you know, a temple here as well. So that really, from us, is like mission accomplished, that we've managed to expose people, get them into seeing the environment, not coming just to see and get their selfie for Instagram at Machu Picchu, but actually slowing down and looking beyond the stonework and the ruins, or actually looking about the ecosystem that exists there and how fascinating it is, and connecting that with the history and having them leave with a greater appreciation of that destination. Not just a fancy hotel, but a hotel that's doing something spectacular and it's educated them about where they came to do so. Um, a few other things that the property does there, they have uh, started, you know, there's a lot of plastic waste um, in Peru. Um, yeah, all of those excursions are included in the room rates. So. Um, I think the bear thing, you're supposed to provide like a donation to do that, but everything else is included in there. Um, so they have actually a um, compacting plastic waste system there because, you know, Peru is just not as advanced when it comes to, you know, the distribution of drinks there. You still have a lot of single use plastic. So um, Incaterra together with one of the, the drink manufacturers, Cielo has put up a, you know, a recycled thing. So they, 14 tons processed daily and recycled in Cusco. They're doing that thanks to the hotel creating the system for the community there. Um, they also have created a biodiesel plant. This was something that the researchers discovered was all the hotels there serving tourism, all their deep fryers and everything, all that cooking oil, people were throwing it down the drain. And it was going right into the Vilcanota Urubamba River, which flows below Machu Picchu. So there was a lot of like, due to the result of tourism, there was a lot of this oil going into the river. And so Incaterra says, hey, we have a perfect solution to this. They built the first biodiesel production plant. So they, the staff of Incaterra actually go around all the other hotels and restaurants in the village of Aguas Calientes, or Machu Picchu village. They collect used cooking oil. They turn it into biodiesel, which now we're using for vehicles elsewhere and for uh, running a lot of things at the property off of biodiesel. So again, Incaterra just way ahead of the pack. Same guy that was like carbon neutral back in 1987 now is producing biodiesel um, out of tourism. So um, the things that aren't included, Incaterra can, if we have guests, you're checking in and they want a private guide going up to uh, do Machu Picchu, they want to hike the one day Inca Trail, Incaterra can arrange all of these additional services for you. Um, most people know us booking the hotels, Incaterra actually does have a private customized trip department team in the office in Lima that'll do like customized trip experiences. Um, not something we promote a lot because most people are working through the fantastic uh, group of DMCs 
and tour operators that we have in Peru who book our hotels as products, but Incaterra does also operate trips for you as well. Um, or if you just are only booking one or two properties and you just need a couple extra services, we can take care of those for you as well. Or you can book them through your, your preferred DMC, either way. Um, a great spa also at Machu Picchu, so I want to throw that in there. And then again, we can do shaman services, we can do special events, they have a wine cellar there. So a lot of additional events we can do here um, at Machu Picchu. So going on to the other property, which is in the Sacred Valley. Um, let me just check, someone had to chat. Um, someone asked about El Mapi. Uh, I wasn't gonna get into that. El Mapi is kind of like a three-star hotel that they have in the village of Aguas Calientes. Um, I don't officially represent that because I do luxury properties but we do have like a more kind of $200 a night rack rate hotel called El Mapi, which is in the village of Aguas Calientes. And there, they don't have all the excursions included. It's more of like kind of a bed and breakfast uh, room rate type of hotel in the village of Aguas Calientes, whereas the, whereas the Machu Picchu Pueblo is like the flagship experience to stay there, the luxury hotel. So again, Inca Terra is not looking just at luxury travel. I understand there's different things. So they're doing sustainable hotel at a different price point in the village uh, of of Aguas Calientes and it's called El Mabi. Um, so going on to the Sacred Valley, this is like kind of like the newest of the properties that opened maybe three or four years ago. This is in the Sacred Valley. Sacred Valley, there's tons of beautiful hotels there. Um, and so I was always curious to see what Inca Terra was gonna do um, in there. So the Sacred Valley sits right in between the high city of Cusco and Machu Picchu. So anybody kind of going to Machu Picchu goes down through the Sacred Valley, okay? It's maybe a 40 mile long valley um, agricultural valley with the river running through it. Actually, I got pictures of it here, um, which sits at a nice elevation. So you're at 9,350 feet compared to 11,000 Cusco. So maybe people that aren't going to the Amazon, um, they might fly into Cusco and first go down and stay in the Sacred Valley at Hacienda Urubamba, um, or stay at Machu Picchu first, or stay at, um, in the Sacred Valley before coming up to Cusco, which is the highest elevation. Um, so the Sacred Valley, this is a picture showing you just what a gorgeous valley it is. And all throughout this valley is full of incredible Incan sites. So most of the Incan rulers, um, you know, who ruled from Cusco, which is only a 45 minute drive away nowadays by car, um, not when they were being carried by people back in the Incan times, but all the Incan rulers have built like their countryside palaces here. This is their countryside homes. So there's incredible ruins and palaces all up and down this that are contributed to different Incan dynasties over the time and different agricultural research stations. So this is actually terracing at the village of Pisac. You probably heard of the Pisac Market. I'll show you a picture of it, but this is one of uh, Inca Pachacutec had built this. And there's a beautiful temple on top of this mountain, and this is the terracing below it. So there's this type of stuff to see. This is the agricultural research station of Morai, which are concentric circles, terraces down in a limestone depression where they experimented with different crops and the amount of sun they were getting and at different elevations. They were trying to mirror like growing, um, growing scenarios throughout different parts of the empire to build better, you know, more resistant crops. So something like that to see in the Sacred Valley. You've got the natural salt mines, which have been mined since Incan times. So natural salt ponds. Um, you have all, the, this is in Pisac, but all these little villages throughout the valley. You have these wonderful indigenous markets. So the Sacred Valley is very much about the countryside, agricultural crops, the rural indigenous lifestyle, and these beautiful Incan palaces. And it's also great for outdoor recreation. So hiking, horseback riding, incredible whitewater rafting on the river that throws through the valley. Um, so there's kind of, if you just want to tour in vehicles to go to the ruins and go to villages, you can do that. If you want to get out and do active stuff, the Sacred Valley is where it's at. So I mean, you can go spend a week in the Sacred Valley and do something different every day, both culturally, um, historically, and then also, you know, outdoor recreation. So this is the Hacienda Urubamba, their hotel in the Sacred Valley. This is the view out from the, the main room. And I said initially, like, there's so many good hotels in the Sacred Valley. You've got like Soli Luna, uh, Belmont has a property. Um, all these others. Um, what makes the Inca Terra Hacienda de Bamba for me so spectacular is this view and the setting. Most of the other hotels are like in the town of Urubamba, when a town of 10,000 people and along busy roads, um, and they're walled in compounds. Whereas Hacienda de Bamba like sits out and it's surrounded by farm fields and it's off the main road. So when you walk out, you're like out in the countryside. That's what you come to the Sacred Valley for is to be out in this agriculture area. So to me, it really like captures the essence of why people come to the Sacred Valley is, um, is to be out um, in this agricultural setting. And that's what Hacienda Urubamba has. So a lot of incredible food coming from the surrounding valley and from their own gardens there at the property. Um, this property has, I have to remember how many rooms, 36 rooms in total, um, again, in different categories. So in the main Hacienda building, we've got superior rooms, but the majority of the rooms are individual casitas up behind the main lodge. Um, so this is, we have 28 of these, so they're individual standalone casitas 
um, not connected to one another, which is fantastic. Um, so you've got your little sitting area outside. So each one of them has captures a just dramatic view looking out over the Sacred Valley. Um, great wine cellar, Eric says. Yeah, it has an incredible wine cellar. I kind of took that out. I've been trying to comb it back, but great wine cellar. Um, so these are the casitas. Um, and then in the main building upstairs, we have suites and junior suites and what's called the owner's suites as well. So different room guys, gorgeously done, gorgeous property. Um, and here, same as in Machu Picchu, we have like all these included excursions. So guests um, that are included in the room rates that guests go out with our own explorer guides on the property to do. So we do bird watching here with totally different species than what they'll have seen at Machu Picchu the days before. Um, there's walks up along this beautiful Incan irrigation line that goes up and down the valley. We also have a chicha house where we make chicha, which is like a fermented corn beer or non-alcoholic um, corn drink. So we take guests in there to see this process and make their own chicha and taste different types of chicha. Um, and then the organic farm. Um, the farm is really pivotal. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about this after I talk about the spa. So they just opened last year, the Mayu Spa. So again, Inca Terra doesn't do things in a traditional way. Yes, this is a beautiful spa. You can get a massage, you get all these treatments and stuff um sauna and everything but what they've done is they have this healing garden so when people go there they're saying hey I, you know suffer from arthritis or whatever i've got allergies um and so you actually go out with one of the treatment people out into the medicinal plant garden and they you go with them and learn about this and you clip different medicinal plants from the andes to then be incorporated into you know whether it's like face masks or body treatments or something that you inhale in um or that's thrown in the sauna. So it's a really cool concept of kind of bringing in and any uh, spiritual healing practices into the spa treatment. Um, so we also do, we often, this is the place more than often people want a shamanic experience there of the Andes. We'll bring, uh, you know, a curandero in um, to do a special event with people. Um, so again, going back to these excursions, the, as since the Sacred Valley is an agricultural area, one of the things that Inca Terra Association has been doing there is working a lot in like, related to food culture and organic um, agriculture. And these local growers who over time, responding to the global market, have been growing one type of corn for the Japanese by most of the corn in the Sega Valley. And they demand a uniformity of one certain type of corn. So a lot of local growers, which they used to grow 300 varieties of corn, they're only doing one or two now, right? And then they're seeing each year that they're having like these diseases which are destroying their crop because if it's, you're all growing one thing and it gets sick, it's gone and they're out of money and they're working harder and harder for very little. So in Katera has this, um, their farm there where we're kind of bringing back heirloom varieties of crops um, that have almost been lost and we're bringing in the local farmers to reintroduce some of these species. And when they see this, they're often like, wow, I remember eating this at my grandfather's farm back in the seventies. I haven't seen it, you know, for 40 years. And then we're saying, why don't you start growing in this? And they say, well, who's going to buy it? Well, who's going to buy it are guys like Chef Helio. Um, who owns Central Restaurant. And so we have a thing set up with Inca Terra Association, like we're doing in Cabo Blanco, where the restaurants are wanting to buy this like beautiful artisanal heirloom varieties of corn and potato and quinoa, which they can't really find. So they're relying on Inca Terra to start working with the local growers and almost like a seed bank and helping these people and making the connections between restaurants. So this is the main thing that's happening at Inca Terra Hacienda de Bamba in terms of the association's impact is with the, in food culture and agriculture there. Okay, last property. Coming up to Cusco, um, highest elevation, 11,152 feet, the gateway, it's where you fly into and out of, you know, getting into this Andean area. Um, Cusco, lovely place. I lived here for 10 years. So it was like a second home to me. Um, this was the capital of the Incan empire. So this was the administrative, the spiritual heart of the Incan dynasty and the Andean people. And then when Francisco Pizarro came in 1532, the conquest of the Incan empire, all those Spanish conquistadors were coming here, obviously greedy for gold and to, you know, take over the Incan Empire. And so over the years, it's like this incredible combination of ancient Incan walls, beautiful colonial architecture and history all mixed together. So it's just like the history of, of Andean Peru is encapsulated into Cusco. It's just a magical place. So this is a fortress just outside of Cusco called Sacsayhuaman, which was a fortress and some of the largest stones used in Incan masonry um, were done here. Um, so you have all these colonial sites to build, visit in the town, you have all these Incan sites, you have museums, you have incredible restaurants. So, I mean, Cusco is the, the place. So people are maybe doing two, three nights in the Amazon, two nights in Machu Picchu, two to four nights in the Sacred Valley, and then two to four nights in Cusco. Um, there's a lot to do in Cusco. I lived there 10 years. I never had a boring day, um, even in the 10th year living there. There was always something fascinating to explore. So this property of Inca Terras, um, 
totally different from the other ones because the conservation work here was not in uh, flora and fauna. This was a historical cultural thing for Peru. The whole time I lived in Peru, this particular building was just in ruins. I mean, it was like there was people squatting in it. It was in ruins. His family owned it and just let it go, um, you know, turn awful. Incaterra bought this with the purpose of restoring this building. I mean, it's one of the most important colonial buildings in Cusco, um, a 16th century manor house. Prior to it being a colonial building, this was actually like the warrior school for the Incas. You can see these walls here with the, the Incan foundations. So it's actually where the Incan warriors were trained. Um, and then during, after the Spanish came, actually Francisco Pizarro, who led the conquest, one of his lieutenants, Diego de Almagro, this was his home. So he lived here for many, many years. Um, so very, very prominent conquistador. This was his personal home. And then it was home to Simon Bolivar when Simon Bolivar was doing his liberation campaign of Peru. So incredible history. And so Inca Terra spent five years um, bringing this building back to its former glory. It was the first Relay Chateau property in Peru. And so this is only for guests. The public cannot enter these doors. So, I mean, it's a very low key entrance. You gotta knock on that little door. They let you in only if you're a guest. No, you can't come in here in the public like a lot of the other luxury hotels in Cusco. So it's a very exclusive private experience. And you come into this building, which is just dripping in history and charm. Um, and it only has 11 rooms in total. So the 11 rooms are kind of located both upstairs and downstairs in this interior courtyard. Um, the fantastic dining because it's a Relay Chateau property. Um, wonderful food. And so talk, showing you a couple of the rooms, this is the, the, there's three different things. There's the sweet patio, which are down on the lower level rooms and then the suites that are the balcon or the balcony suites on the second level of that and then we have the main the plaza view suites and i mean looking at this picture you can see like those frescoes those were found under decades of like wallpaper and paint and everything and they actually brought a, a guy from italy who went through all that and got down to the frescoes and brought these back to life by hand so just like you know this also just exhibits Inca Terra's prowess and its design and Joey Kecklin the founder it's actually his wife Denise is the one that's responsible for all this interior design and she has the furniture made as to the period so you're basically sleeping in Simon Bolivar's room when you're staying at La Casona so this was a, a wonderful thing that the Inca Terra Association did for humanity and for you know cultural patrimony of Peru of, of restoring this beautiful building so it's not all about flora and fauna Inca Terra is also just about the culture and the history of Peru as well protecting it um, we also have a small spa there as well. So that was it. 53 minutes, a little bit over my 45, not quite an hour. Um, I am going to look and see what questions have been asked, if anybody's even still here. Oh, there's 71 people here. Um, and I'm going to scroll through. Uh, what time is last show? So but anyways, thanks for attending. I'm going to send this to you afterwards. Um, but I'm going to answer some questions if you want to hang around and answer some more questions. We can chat. Uh, when's the last time shuttle bus go back down? So generally the shuttle buses operate, um, I think the last bus goes down at 5.30 p.m. Um, you know, sun sets at about six. So I think you have to be lined up at 5.30 and it leaves at 5.45. Um, so that's it. So you can be up there, I think from 5.30 and then the last one leaves at, at 5.30 p.m. Um, Hacienda Concepcion, do the rooms on the lodge have ensuite bathrooms? Yes, they do. They all have those. Uh, let's see what else we got okay please hey, thanks sandra yeah. brett's going for a bike ride have a good bike ride brett um let's see if there's any other questions best web